Hi, I'm Tom Payton, director and publisher of Trinity University Press. Thanks for joining us for the Dear America Town Hall. Monthly until the election in November, Trinity University Press and Terrain.org will bring you virtual town hall events featuring contributors to the new book, Dear America, Letters of Hope, Habitat, Defiance, and Democracy. With a patriotic spirit, hundreds of writers, artists, scientists, and community leaders have come together since the 2016 presidential election to offer their impassioned words through Terrain.org's Letters to America project, now collected in this book. In the Dear America Hall Town Hall events, we'll explore different themes, including the natural environment, violence and injustice, and activism and protest, all focused on reconciling conflicting political and social perspectives, reconsidering moral imperatives, and inspiring meaningful change. As a mission-driven organization, Trinity publishes each book with great intentionality. We're proud of all of them. But it's rare that a book has true urgency. When we learned about this project a year or so ago, we knew it was an important book for us to be a part of publishing. It's a critical collection for the times in which we live and a call to action in light of such urgent challenges facing us today. The event tonight is also streamed live on Facebook and archived there on the Trinity University Press page. The print and ebook is available at your favorite neighborhood or online retailer, but it's also available at a special price just for you at DearAmericaBook.org. In light of the current times, please consider buying additional copies to share. Use it as a tool and provide it to your family members, neighborhood, uh, neighbors, colleagues, even a donation to your local library, perhaps. This is a book we need to read right now. To me, it helps us calmly but honestly assess where we are and have hope for the future alone and together. And now speaking of being together, it's my pleasure to introduce Derek Sheffield, one of the three editors of the book. Derek is the poetry editor at Terrain and an accomplished poet in his own right, as well as a professor of English at Wenatchee Valley College in Washington State. Thanks again for joining us, enjoy. I am so happy to be able to host this evening's reading with such terrific writers. On behalf of myself and my wonderful co-editors, Simmons Bunton and Elizabeth Dodd, welcome and thank you to everyone who's joined us. Tonight's town hall reading is themed against hatred, writing that builds community. I'll say just a bit more about the book to go with what uh, Tom had to tell us, uh, Dear America, Letters of Hope, Habitat, Defiance, and Democracy. This is such a powerful and diverse collection of poems, prose pieces, and artwork. A third of the book consists of new, never before published work. These are letters that don't appear in our online series. So even if you read terrain.org regularly, you'll want a copy of this book. And as Tom mentioned, if you go to dearamericabook.org and don't make the mistake I did when I first tried this out, don't type it in the address line at the top of Google, type it into the search bar, Dear America Book, all one word, uh, .org, you can enter the promo code town hall and get 20% off. All royalties go to three essential nonprofits, the Union of Concerned Scientists, the Natural Resources Defense Fund, and the American Civil Liberties Union. And this portal, dearamericabook.org, is the way to maximize funds to those three stalwart organizations. This is not just a book, this is a cause. Meanwhile, the online series continues. We've published 184 letters at terrain.org, including just this morning, one by Chon Ballard. We invite you to visit terrain.org after tonight's town hall to read Chon's powerful letter. While you are there, please take note of our site's new design, which we are quite proud of, 
and a couple of recent additions, namely a section devoted to helping teachers and community groups use Terrain.org and Dear America as a place-based and ad-free and, uh, well, in terms of the website itself, free, free resource for education called teachterrain.org. You'll see that on the website when you first go there. And you will also notice our recently articulated commitment to action and statement on racial justice. Okay, now it's time to turn to our readers. We'll go in this order. Bloss, Kurt, Drew, and Jane, and I will introduce each one before they read. Now, audience, if a question comes to mind as you listen, uh, you can send it through the Q&A button, and we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for that conversation at the end. So here's a little bit about Bloss Falconer. He is the author of Forgive the Body, This Failure, which came out from Four Way Books in 2018. He teaches in the MFA program at San Diego State University. His awards include an NEA fellowship and the Marine Egan Writers Exchange. I can also tell you that he is one of Rita Dove's favorite poets and his poem, Fatherland, which we'll get to hear tonight, is a consistent favorite of my students, so much so that some of them now know it by heart. Bloss, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, oh, am I muted? No, okay, great. <laughs> thank you, Derek. Thank you, um, Trinity University Press and terrain.org for bringing us together today. Um, I'm going to read three poems. The first will be my um, contribution to the project, and then I'll read two others that are included in the anthology. Fatherland. The heat not having broken all month long, we stood in line and watched a boy race down the park's tallest slide, drop into the shallow pool below, from which he rose, renewed, a look of joy, relief, across his face. My son held my hand, and looking up, judged how long it'd take to reach the top of the stairs. In front of us, the man, a head taller, 50 pounds at least, more than I, wore red trunks, his hair dark brown, short. I saw the swastika first, white power inked across his back. The seen skeletons climbed his spine above a sea of flames. I felt each breakable bone in my boy's hand. He, who days before asked to live with us forever. Idiot. My mother called me once. Because you think everyone is good. The man looked across the park at no one, younger than I'd have thought. And when the line, as if with one mind, began to move again, he stepped forward, the foot or two between us, perilous, uncrossable. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is by a poet I'm a fan of named Juan Morales. And his um, poem is titled, 20,000 Pallets of Bo Bottled Water, September 20th, 2018. On a runway in Saba, under blue tarps pulled taut, FEMA's water shipment still sits one year after Maria. Against a backdrop of the people boiling river water, 
the agency apologizes for distribution issues. Officials promising to test each bottle, though everyone knows it's as foul as their island support. In the gaze of the aerial shots, pallet after pallet, stretching out like a crumpled runway, the tallies of the dead jump from 64 to 3,000. And the mainland president tweets congratulations to all on a job well done. The island is a dry throat, a voice in the eye of the aftermath, hissing words unspoken elsewhere. Commonwealth, statehood, independence. And I'm going to finish with a poem by Victoria Chang called Obit. Obit. America died on February 14th, 2018, and my dead mother doesn't know. Since her death, America has died a series of small deaths, each one less precise than the next. My tears are now shaped like hooks, but my heart is damp still. If it is lucky, it is in the middle of its beats. The unlucky dead children hold telegrams they must hand to a woman at a desk. The woman will collect their belongings and shadows. My dead mother asks each of these children if they know me, have seen me, how tall my children are now. They will tell her that they once lived in Florida, not California. She will see the child with the hole in his head. She will blow the dreams out of the hole like dust. I used to think death was a kind of anesthesia. Now I imagine long lines, my mother taking in all the children. I imagine her touching their hair, how she might tickle their knees to make them laugh. The dead hold the other half of our ticket. The dead are an image of wind. And when they comb their hair, our trees rustle. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of applause because I can. Um, thank you so much, Bloss. That was kind of eviscerating and beautifully so. Uh, Kurt Caswell's newest book of nonfiction, uh, which I can tell you and David James Duncan and Barry Lopez can tell you is brilliant, is Laika's Window, The Legacy of a Soviet Space Dog. He is also author of Getting to Grey Owl, Journeys of, on Four Continents, and In the Sun's House, my year teaching on the Navajo Reservation. He teaches writing, literature, and outdoor leadership in the Honors College at Texas Tech University. And he has recently hiked out of the woods and trimmed his beard to be with us tonight. Thank you so much, Kurt, for joining us. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> and uh, thanks, thanks to you, Derek, and to Simmons and Elizabeth. Uh, for putting this beautiful book together and to Trinity University Press. So the piece I'm reading uh, from Dear America is uh, titled The River Between Us. On October 9th, 2017, at about 8 p.m., a 19-year-old student at the university where I teach was escorted to the campus police headquarters for a welfare check. Once inside the building, he pulled a handgun, killed the campus police officer leading him in, and fled on foot. Campus, city, and state police, along with county sheriff's deputies and a SWAT team, captured him in about two hours. The morning after, the university community was on edge. Police sirens sang all over the campus because everything, every one, every twittering leaf looked like a bomb about to explode. 
The shooting on my campus followed the then deadliest mass shooting in US history in Las Vegas, which followed other shootings in schools, in public places, and in private homes. This shooting, that shooting, whatever shooting. Meanwhile, our United States have endured unprecedented wildfires in the West, frequent and destructive hurricanes in the South and East, and massive flooding in the riverlands. And these events paralleled the latest newsworthy scandal. For example, Hollywood's Harvey Weinstein for decades of sexual misconduct. And then come the lies from his famous friends and colleagues in order to distance themselves from him. Initially, the Clintons, Meryl Streep, and Judy Dench, followed by many, many others. They all knew and did nothing because it was in their interest to do nothing. Money and power, fame and fortune, keeping it for them, keeping it from us. And the champion headliner of all time, President Trump, exchanging threats with North Korea, then later Iran, tossing about words to see the garden in hell. To live in America in the 21st century is to live inside a bubble flush with oxygen while someone goes around distributing matches. The United States is not the greatest country in the world. The president of the United States is not the leader of the free world. And the American dream, if ever it was alive at all, is dead. We all know these three truths and still our politicians, our corporations and our media spoon lies down our throats to keep us, the citizenry, doing what is in their best interest. Buy, spend, consume, keep your mouth shut. Dial it out a few hundred miles into earth orbit and note that these problems are human problems, human created and of concern almost exclusively to humans. They are distractions merely from real problems. They are as petty as we are petty. And while we all champion our special causes on Facebook and Twitter, another disaster beats us flat. Trump is not the problem, nor is he the answer. No matter your, or sorry, his tactics of, of chaos and obfuscation are a distraction merely. No matter your position, you and I, all of us, contributed to the cultural, economic, and political climate in which Trump was elected. Everything you love or despise about him is a reflection of us, which means it is a reflection of you. So then, you are the problem, and I am the problem. We are all the problem, and the problem with our problem is that it puts us off the real problem, the biggest problem of all, global climate change and the mass species extinction, even now unfolding on Earth. In his essential book, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, Roy Scranton spells out the future of humanity in, the wor in this world we have created. He does not offer a possibility of climate change impacts if we don't take action now. Climate action is the impotent cry of the establishment. And he does not mourn the bunnies and bees of our special time on earth. The earth will be just fine without us, just as it was before us. And just as Mars is fine, perfect and beautiful even, with no life at all. What Scranton is willing to say and what we all know is true but are unwilling to accept is that climate change will lead to the collapse of our civilization and all its wonders. This civilization is already dead, writes Scranton. Things are going to look a lot different from here on out, and you and I are powerless against it. Trump is powerless against it. Monsanto and Exxon and Amazon are powerless against it. The United Nations is powerless against it. My father gave 34 years of his life to working for the US Forest Service before he went to work for the state of Idaho and then to Washington DC to direct the Bureau of Land Management under President Bush. 
Mine was a boyhood in wild places, a collection of government houses around a district office in the mountains in Oregon. There I roamed freely among the trees and creeks, caught lizards sunning on the rocks, fished from a canoe in the lake near the house, and attended a school of just over 30 students, kindergarten through eighth grade. To me in those days, the world was a wilderness with, with a few scattered cities, none of which I had ever seen. It wasn't until high school or even after that I realized that while fossil fuels are flowing, the world appears to be just the opposite, a sea of cities whose influence pushes into the few remaining and scattered wild lands. And this is so more and more each day. There is no solution to the problem of global climate change. Democracy and its capitalist economy will not fix it. A dictator and a communist economy will not fix it. A culture war between us and them will not fix it. A race war will not fix it. A gender war between men and women will not fix it. I recycle, avoid driving and turn off lights and electronics in my house that I'm not using. And even if everyone in the world does so too, the Earth's warmer future will still arrive. It is here already. And what is left for us to do? Cope, adapt, endure. I lived and taught school for a year on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico. During that time and after, I read widely about Navajo history and culture. In the Navajo creation story, there is a time when women and men come to such odds that the creator decides the only solution is to separate them by a river. The men are forced to live on one side, the women are forced to live on the other. Time passes and the people begin to complain. The women miss what the men have to offer and the men miss what the women have to offer. Each discovers that men and women are not the same and they are not equal. Men and women are complementary. Women possess attributes that men do not have. Men possess attributes that women do not have. In the Navajo story, the lamentations of the women and men finally prompt the creator to put them all back on the same side of the river and they live together with their differences as before. In the warmer future we have created Human beings, all of us everywhere, are going to face real challenges, challenges that threaten even our species' viability. The extinction of Homo sapiens is not a Hollywood movie script only. It's a real possibility within the next century. There is no more time to publicly honor all our private wounds. Instead, we must honor our strengths and our differences. Then one group of people with similar, similar beliefs and values may use their strengths to help another group of people with different beliefs and values. Globalism is not the answer because its underlying mission is to further consolidate wealth and resources, a system designed to ensure that most of us serve a few of them. The answer, or perhaps our best chance, is some form of cooperative tribalism, which brings together the best of what each group has to offer to benefit the whole. And groups would cooperate with one another because we have a common enemy, global climate change, which is to say ourselves. In the warmer future, women and men are going to need one another. Indigenous people and so-called non-Indigenous people are going to need one another. People with darker skin tones and people with lighter skin tones are going to need one another. People whose lives are guided by the Quran and people whose lives are guided by the Bible are going to need one another. In fact, we need one another now. If we, all, if we can't all come over to the same side of the river and then walk together onto higher ground, it is the river that will inundate both sides and wash everything out to sea. Thank you for listening. Oh, wow. Thank you, Kurt. Um, 
that um, letter is even more poignant for me now as a listener, as a reader, than it was when we um, then we first published it um, because of how I've been separated from so many people for so long. <clears throat> well, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next reader. Drew Lanham is an ornithology professor at Clemson University who writes to the intersections of race, place, and nature. His book, The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature, was named a scholarly book of the decade by the Chronicle of Higher Education and a memoir of the decade by Lit Hub. He's the poet laureate of Edgefield, South Carolina, and the author of Sparrow Envy Poems. You may have heard about what happened to a bird watcher named Christian Cooper about almost exactly a month ago uh, in Central Park when he asked a woman to please put her dog on a leash. Well, as you'll hear, Drew has been living that story that Christian Cooper found himself in and writing poignantly about it for some time. Now, due to a last minute time conflict, Drew could not be with us in his live form tonight, but he kindly met with me on Zoom and recorded his letter to America for you. So Drew, go ahead and take it away. Good evening, my name is Drew Lanham and I'd like to share a piece with you that I wrote for the Letters to America called Still Birding While Black. Just a little bit of background. I'm a birder. I'm an ornithologist professionally, but I've been bird watching since I was, I don't know, seven or eight years old. And as birders, we have local patches, places where we go to see favorite birds that are familiar to us, that are comfortable to us. That, um, you can run in, get in, get out, see your birds and um, maybe make your day better. This just happened to be a day when I was out to see a particular species of bird called crown sparrow in a local patch that didn't go so well. Hey America, was out birding a while back, black as I am and have always been, checking out my white crown sparrow honey hole absorbing one of my fave winter birds, fully engrossed in their melancholy leftover Northwood songs and snazzy namesake stripe-headed plumages, I wasn't expecting to have my identity challenged as I was identifying them. In the face of the daily, how can we insult the people of color Oval Office challenge, I was trying hard, America, do my, doing my own nature-loving, bird-adoring thing watching and reveling, escaping as it were, when this old farmer approached to tell me in this very odd, one-sided pickup window to pickup window exchange that he thought the world was a better place with niggers knowing their place and picking cotton. Really? Right there in the middle of my ornithological reverie, a brontosaurus-sized macroaggression, complete with racial pejoratives and a couple of unveiled half-threats of shooting trespassers who didn't know their place, thrown in for good hate-monger measure. Well, America, I took the old man at his word, and eventually I left. Whatever the bitter, slick taste was that welled up on the back of my tongue was warning enough that maybe I should find another place to watch birds. So much for nature's respite and free roaming choice. To have someone come at me with threats and hateful ideas of revisionist history like that was, well, was in my mind a forewarning to a wishful lynching. I guess the old man was feeling his impunity oats 
and making his personal contribution to a great, again, nation. A racist affront on a country road bird watching in South Carolina seems like a long way from 1400 Pennsylvania Avenue, but I guess there's a shortcut to being emboldened when the right to spew such rhetoric comes from on high. Can't say some horrific consequences of birding while black anywhere in America don't cross my mind more often these days. Caution trumps life list. So I traded sparrows in for a loggerhead shrike, an appropriately black and white feather macigenated bird. I seek my birds in places where white supremacists are less likely to abound. I consider my range now changed. Regretfully, Drew. So, America, that's my letter to you. It seems that we're appropriately in a time of range change. Many of us bound to home, to smaller patches. In that case, I was misled into believing that a patch that I thought I knew was safe. And so it's not a place that I visit anymore because my range was changed by racism. Hoping, hoping there are better days ahead for us all. Hoping the white crown sparrows are still finding some happiness in those hedgerows. And hoping that one day I get to, <laughs> get to once again be among them. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Drew, Drew's recording um, for sharing your letter to America. <clears throat> Jane Hirschfield's just published ninth book of poetry, Ledger, centers on the crises of the biosphere and social justice, which I think you're hearing tonight are inseparable crises. She has also just published two now classic books about poetry, Nine Gates and Ten Windows, and four books collecting the work of world poets from the past. A former chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, her work appears in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Orion, The New York Times, the New York Review of Books, and perhaps most impressively of all, terrain.org, and 10 editions of the best American poems. Her poems are also consistent favorites of my students. And I gotta say, she's got my vote as one of our finest poets. Again and again, as I read her softly, calmly, immensity taps at my life. Jane, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Derek. Um, it is a great honor to be part of this evening and it is a great honor to be part of this volume and the series that gave birth to it. Uh, absolutely necessary, absolutely indispensable for us all to hear so many voices speaking into our crises, our dilemma, our grief, occasionally glimpses of our joy. Um, so I'm going to read three pieces tonight, two by other people and one of my own, and begin with a poem by Gary Soto, a poet I've known since uh, I lived briefly in Fresno about 40 years ago. After his election, I make a Zen garden. A pie tin, five cups of sand, a thimble with water, a dry branch, a cotton ball worth of moss, river pebbles and polished stone, maybe a small shell, maybe glass roughed up by the sea. And by noon, 
I have a garden. Let me go inside a tree for the next few years. I offer a spring blossom to my creation. I hum a three-syllable chant. I rake the sand and dip my pinky into the thimble. So this is the taste of Buddha mind. This is my garden after the election. This is my sanctuary on a windowsill, a monk-like ant trekking the ledge. A stick of incense is lit, the dead remembered. I feel a terrible force at work. A hundred days in office, not enough sand to bury his deeds. For the second selection from the book, I'm going to read a prose piece, fairly, fairly short, uh, by the amazing uh, Kathleen Dean Moore. It's called A Great Dawn Chorus. Dear America, here is a small parable from Oregon where marsh hawks are hunting over flooded fields, even as darkness pools under streetlights in Washington and New York. My friend, a small woman in Alaska, could not sleep. How can any of us sleep? So much work to be done to save democracy, to save decency, to save children, to save the marsh hawks, for God's sake, and even the flooded fields. We could work all the bright day and all through the night, and still the work would not be done, and how can it even begin? My friend lay awake in a darkened room, one hand gripping the other. Who can let herself fall asleep when she has not found a way to save the world? Because that's the task we set ourselves, each of us. Is this not so? Every evening she watched as bare branches and telephone lines sliced the falling sun as if it were an egg yolk and the day darkened. Until one night she remembered that the sun was, of course, not falling. The far edge of the earth was rising. As each of us falls into bed at night, exhausted and despondent because we have not yet finished our work, the sun is rising on the other side of the planet, and other people are rising to the challenge of protecting what is flourishing and just and beautiful. On the rotating planet, there's a great dawn chorus of committed people, millions and millions of them, who rise from their beds or mats or blankets, rustle up coffee or etol or tea, and set off to do the good work of defending the world's thriving. We can hear the chorus if we listen. The rustle, the creak of doors, tin or wood or grass, voices calling, out to one another in a thousand languages, the roar of action advancing around the world, awakened like birds by the rising sun. When night comes now, my friend is able to sleep. And when the dawn comes, she takes up her part of the work that others, exhausted, have laid down. Because my friend is Alaskan singer-songwriter Libby Roderick, her part of the work is to write the songs. Here are some of the words she wrote in The Cradle of Dawn. Sunset in your country, sunrise in mine. Lay down your body, hear mine begin to rise. Sunset in my country, sunrise in yours. I feel you there in the dawn. There are no promises that we will see the day. The dreams we live for all will succeed. But I can promise you that halfway around the world, I'll hold the light up while you sleep. Each of us will emerge full-throated from the dark shelter of our private despair. We will find our cause. We will find our chorus. We will find our courage. And then nothing can stop our collective action. Not troopers on a North Dakota highway, not Uber bankers, not sniveling oligarchs or complacent professors. Then nothing can distract us, not football, not shopping, not even composting. There might have been a time when our work for the world was in our private lives, focused on exemplary recycling or some such. That time has passed. Our work now 
is in the streets, in the state houses, on the riverbanks, in the college quad, and on the path by the flooded field. What we cannot do alone, we can do together. This is not the end of the small story I offer. This is the beginning. Courage, Kathleen. And for my last piece, I will read my own contribution to the book. Uh, this poem, spelled to be said against hatred, after I wrote it, I have very rarely said it out loud because I am not a good enough actor to give the words the way I hear them interiorly. But after George Floyd's death, I found myself unable to be silent. It was just untenable not to have some response. And so I simply uh, recorded the poem and put it out on the internet because while it is very much my job to be listening now, it is also all of our job to respond. And so here is spelled to be said against hatred. Until each breath refuses they, those, them. Until the traumatis personae of the book's first page says, each one is you. Until hope bows to its hopelessness only as one self bows to another. Until cruelty bends to its work and sees suddenly, I. Until anger and insult know themselves burnable legs of a useless table. Until the unsurprised, unbidden knees find themselves bending. Until fear bows to its object as a bird's shadow bows to its bird. Until the ache of the solitude inside the hands, the ribs, the ankles. Until the sound the mouse makes inside the mouth of the cat. Until the inaudible acids bathing the coral. Until what feels no one's weighing is no longer weightless. Until what feels no one's earning is no longer taken. Until grief, pity, confusion, laughter, longing know themselves mirrors. Until by we, we mean I, them, you, the muskrat, the tiger, the hunger. Until by I, we mean as a dog barks, sounding and vanishing and sounding and vanishing completely. Until by until, we mean I, we, you, them, the muskrat, the tiger, the hunger, the lonely barking of the dog before it is answered. Thank you for listening. Well, Jane, that may not match the voice that you hear inside you, but um, it sure moved me listening to read that tonight. And again, I apprehend it differently um, in the America that I'm living in now compared to the America of a year ago when we, uh, or so when we first published your spell to be said against hatred. Um, and thank you um, for giving us, you may have noticed that your poem gave us the theme for um, tonight's town hall. And I think it shows once again that, that these, um, that, that the crisis of social justice we find ourselves in is inseparable from the crisis of environmental justice, the violence that we do to what we deem as other.
comes from the same place. So uh, listen, before I know the questions are flooding in, um, actually that's a joke. I, I'm not, I've seen some really lovely comments here um, uh, for uh, Drew and, and some of our other, um, one fella here, Ed, thank you very much. He says, this is the best of dozens of Zoom events I've attended in the last two months. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Ed. Uh, so if anybody has a question, go ahead and add it now to the Q&A and we'll see it and direct it to um, our panelists. Uh, before we get to those questions, I do want to announce the next in our series of town hall readings. Uh, as you know, we have one planned each month till November of 2020. Uh, Terrain.org editor-in-chief, the big guy himself, Simmons Bunton, will moderate the July event. Um, it's uh, July 22nd. The theme of which is the other Americas, writing across geographies and heritage with Sandra Steingraber, Francisco Cantu, Diana Babineau, and Dean Rader. Uh, again, this will take place July 22nd at 7 p.m. Central, um, 5 p.m. Pacific time, of course. You can register now at dearamericabook.org. Um, and, oh, speaking of Dear America, I can tell you from personal experience that this book makes a marvelous textbook and especially since our beautiful education editor, Janine DeBase, created a bunch of uh, resources for teaching it, different prompts and ways to interact with this book that works uh, in the classroom. We know that it's being taught in high schools, in community colleges, in universities, and also has been adopted by some community groups um, who are using it uh, in an attempt to build togetherness and um, work for the kind of America that the book envisions. So, um, let's see. Okay, oh, thank you, Kurt, yes. So here, I have a question for you panelists. Um, would anyone want to comment on what the letter form means to you as an idea, even if your contribution doesn't start with a salutation or look much like a letter? What does the concept of writing to America mean for you right now? I'll, I'll get us started. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah great. Um, so uh, one thing that was really interesting about writing this poem is that you um the for this project is that we got the intimacy of the epistle of the letter and then we had the scope of the of the of the audience or who we were writing to the country the entire country and so there was this it was you know the project acknowledges both kind of the, the private and the public and as i was writing um i thought a lot about this and how um how often the political is personal. And, um, and I also thought about how writing a letter to the country, you are um, sharing an experience that with, with someone that might not be aware that, that, that other people are experiencing something like, you know, white supremacy or, you know, gun violence or what have you. They might just be seeing it on the news. Um, and you're also, maybe presenting an experience that, that, that your reader does share. So this, um, it, you know, which seems equally important. So to me, as I was writing this, I was thinking about both the private and the, and the public and the personal and the political and, and how those two could merge so easily it, um, with the prompt itself. So to me, it was, I think that my poem is different from so many of my others because of that. Well, and Blas, is it true that this poem that you wrote for this project, which 
really is a daunting task and many incredible writers have not been able to to make art in response to this task very understandably um but is it true that this is this will be the title poem of your next collection it will it will actually um what's funny is that originally it was called dear america and that i loved having that as a title for the poem as i was writing it but then of course it couldn't be the same title as the book. So you asked if there was another one and I came up with the fatherland and, um, and it, and it felt, um, it felt appropriate for the book that I'm working on now. Um, and, um, and, uh, and I thought that this would be a, yeah, a kind of a, a good, um, book, um, a title poem for the book. Right. So it will be. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it works so beautifully for the poem because, um, you know, the fatherland of the character in the red shorts with the tattoo in front of you, yes. uh, there's a fatherland there that is um, a different one from the father holding his son's hand and feeling every breakable bone um, in that precious boy's hand. Um, so we do have a couple of other questions here, but before we turn to those, did anybody else want to speak to this epistolary question? Well, I will say that all of my poems are communications that probably begin first to myself. There is no problem in the world which is not a problem in my own interior life. Um, and so, you know, so, so my, my poem, my poems have increasingly become over the years more public facing in terms of the issues that they speak of, I think because the need to address these things has become so pressing for me as an individual. This, it is, it is as blunt a blow as anything that could possibly happen to me personally to try to fathom the vanishing of two billion birds, to try to fathom the vanishing of a language from the face of the earth every two weeks, to try to fathom the ruining of the fresh water on which all life depends. And for me, you know, because the, the very piece that's in the book is a piece about dissolving the pronouns, dissolving the separation between I and we and you and them and recognizing that all of these are fluidly present together. That's what existence is made of, of, of uh, not separate tribes, not separable issues, not separable lives. Um, and so, you know, to, to write a letter to America can't be done for me without writing a letter to myself and my own perplexity at the damage that we human beings, all of us, are capable of doing. So the questioning is of myself as much as of the culture. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, and. I think when you were saying that there's no problem that's out there that isn't also in here, it made me think of, of Kurt's letter that he shared with us tonight. And it made me think too, as, you, as I was listening, you, your interior voice may be louder than mine because you, you had a vow of silence for how many years did you, were you silent? Well, I, I spent, um eight years mostly in formal Zen practice, but three of them were in a monastery. And in a monastery, you are almost entirely silent unless there is some very good reason to speak. But also in that particular monastery, at least during those years, we were instructed to do nothing but practice Zen. And so that included not writing poems. One haiku broke through from me at, at about 3.30 in the morning on, uh, during the second year while I was having my pre-meditation cup of coffee. But other than that, I kept to the rule and simply walked away from everything else except trying to listen to what you can hear when you are not distracted. You hear mountain lions. 
you hear starlight, you hear your own voice going on and on and on, and you hear what happens when that voice quiets a little. Mm, beautiful, thank you. Um, so we do have, uh, there's a couple of questions here I want to answer real quick, and then there's one directed to you, Jane, or, and to everyone um, in follow-up to your comment, Jane. So the great uh, Rena Espayat, um, who is also in this book, um, you've got a, this one of the original works published um, in here, uh, has asked, hey, hey, Rena, it's great to see your name um, here, uh, has asked, are there any poems in foreign language in the book? Um, no, we don't have, uh, have any in foreign language. They're all in, um, in English. Um, we sure love having your poem in there, which is masterful in its form, as always. So another question from uh, anonymous attendee is, in response to Jane's comment about writing first to herself, is the answer in, uh, uh, about writing first to herself, is the answer in the individual, or like Kurt's story, is it in the community, or both? Let's let Kurt take that one first. <laughs> well, I don't know if I have the answer, but um, a dear friend of mine taught me that wisdom is in the community, um, that it is shared by the collective as opposed to say the individual where we celebrate uh, that individual, at least in our culture, where we tend to, especially in media and film, um, but in fact, wisdom is held in, in collective in the, in, in, in the community. And, you know, that's what I was thinking too about um, in, in my piece and talking about the differences of people that often it seems to me when we are trying to augment our sameness, um, we're still in conflict. And I thought, well, the differences that we, we have too are important, you know, that if one person can say, uh, here's what I have to offer the, the community and another person says, well, I have something else uh, and here's what it is. And we put all those pieces together and then maybe we can find a way forward. And it's not necessarily that our sameness that will get us there. Um, so that, that's, what I, that's what's on my mind. And I guess what I will add in agreement with that is that I really don't see these as separable entities. It's ecosystems all the way up and down. What is the self made of? The self is made of the community. What is the community made of? The community is made of our aggregated lives. And, and what is a healthy ecosystem as opposed to a fragile ecosystem made of. It is made of the resilience of every one of its parts finding a balance of thriving, a balance of, of uh, what is enough. You know, too much is as bad for in any ecosystem as, as too little is. And then, you know, we can get into the, the, uh, the Serengeti rules uh, uh, apex predators and keystone species. So I don't want to under rely on every single person's necessary contribution. And I don't want to disrespect the fact that we are always in conversation, always in collaboration, always always part of both the collective and uh, the interior lives. Uh, was, was that Barry Lopez who said that, Kurt? That sounded so that much like Barry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so another uh, question here. How have recent events changed the initial voice of your poems, letters, um, or anyone? That one might be for you, actually, Derek. 
right? For the co for the project, do you think? Oh, um, I don't know. The initial voice of your poems or letters, I don't know if I can speak to that. Uh, I can tell you that the that the project is as vibrant as ever. Um, it started a week after the 2016 election, and um, uh, it uh, you know we just published Chad's um, poem this morning, and we're continuing. People are still finding out about it. We're getting um, really uh, marvelous. Uh, poems, letters, essays that will continue uh, to publish until, you know, we don't have to. So I will say that, that um, you know, I have found not only this poem, as I said, changed its nature when suddenly it was what I needed to read myself following George Floyd's murder, um, but many of, many of my poems have altered their meaning with the pandemic, with the great uprising that we are currently experiencing of, of social justice. But also, you know, listening to, to um, Kurt's piece, I wondered how does the fact that, you know, one of the astonishing things to me about our current world is we have actually proven to ourselves that you know, not all humanity, but a rather enormous percentage of humanity can actually just stop. You know, the environment changed, the air grew cleaner because we all decided to stop. And if we could take in the absolute mortal urgency of climate change, the way we can take in the mortal urgency of the coronavirus, could we actually make a collective decision to behave differently? And so listening to Kurt's piece, I heard it with different ears, knowing that you know, proof of concept has actually been established, even though it is now, especially in our own country, breaking down so badly. But we have proved that we can make a large decision and behave differently, at least for six weeks. I think some of that too requires uh, effective leadership. You know, that some of our taking in the, the urgency of, uh, of the pandemic is um, from our governors and local mayors and um, that we need that we need that uh, that help too to bring people together and send us in a direction and as you're saying if we could get that kind of directive from our governments all over the all over the world around climate change um, that would that would be a dramatic moment in our history Well said, thank you. Um, so um, I think we're coming to about the end of our time here. Uh, we've got one more uh, question here for you, Jane. Um, I'm so curious about your process of writing and revision. I know it's a huge discussion. Can you talk about the process you went through in the writing of your spell? Uh, to be set against hatred, perhaps? Well, that is rather a lengthy question <laughs> answer in general. But, you know, I will, I will say that, um, so this isn't the first spell I've written. There were five of them in a much earlier book, uh, The Lives of the Heart, 1997. I wrote a series of five spells, and I didn't think I would ever do another. I thought I'd sort of covered it. There was birth, death, sleep, illness, and waking up. Um, and then this spell, um, it had to be written. Why do you turn to a spell? You turn to a spell because normal language, normal syntax, normal diction cannot carry 
either the feeling or the intention of the poem. Spells are written in imperatives usually. This poem isn't. It's got a slightly different strategy with its until, until, until. Mostly spells are written in imperative verbs. But basically, I listened. I heard it. Poems begin for me with first their need and then if it is possible for me to become permeable enough that I can listen to what a voice which is not coming out of ordinary thinking, but out of the whole self, you know, there, there is a famous description of poetry is written with the whole body and it's written with the whole being. It's written with every fact you've ever learned, every event you've ever lived, every emotion you've ever felt, um, every glimpse you've had of anything. You never know what's going to come in sideways into the poem and suddenly be the very image. And so basically this poem was um, heard. It was a dictation of the, of the inner voice, which then of course, you know, I, I always do at least ask my poems if they want to be revised. But I think Almost all thought comes to us in these ways, and the deeper thoughts we human beings are capable of having will always include the language that knows more than we do, the musicality of poetry, which allows us to think with our emotions and our bodies and our breathing and our heartbeats. And, and I think all thought which is expanded from what you could think if you weren't doing it in the form of art or or deep meditative concentration or whatever it is that allows us to not be our superficial selves but to be our larger larger selves in the service of something larger than just ego and it's um, I don't want to be dismissive of ego, but you know, it's, it's clamor for, for this and that, which might not be the most important thing. Um, it depends on a kind of setting aside of your own skin and allowing what you don't yet know to come into you, to come into the voice, to come into the pen, to come onto the page. That's a very inadequate answer to a large question, but it's the best I can do right now. Well, that's, pretty darn great. I kind of have the feeling. I just want to sit here and listen to you all night, Jane. Um, and you've you. plunged into darkness, you know. Um, I, <laughs> I have. Um, I think it's because you're heightening my interiority. So, um, well, you know, I was, I was thinking about what listening to you was thinking about um, my teacher, David Wagner, mm. said something about how we can you know, just hope that we don't get uh, get in the way of ourselves. Derek, I was gonna, I, would, I just wanna say how much I appreciated that answer, Jane, and how thinking about this project, it's like we're, we're often approaching these subjects that when they're talked about, usually they're a series of bullet points that everybody has, kind of these pat answers. But when you approach, you know, often a letter but especially a poem, it's you don't know what you're gonna say. There is an openness to it. So someone had asked about like why, uh, someone had asked a question about how this kind of might change the conversation. And I think it's because um, we're entering a conversation where the, um, you know, we're not hitting those talking points. We really are trying to discover how we feel about something or what we think about something and engage in a, converse, a conversation and beginning a conversation. And, and, and Jane's answer to that question made me kind of bring the, to, you know, together, like all these ideas together of why the kind of the political and the private, the personal and the public, like work so well in this, in this project. Because mm -hmm. the conversation feels real. Thank you, Blas. It's that ecosystem again, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, our, our inseparability. And I love that you brought up the questions. Um, because I sometimes think for a work of art, you know, science answers the questions for which there are actual answers. Mm -hmm.
and art answers the questions for which there are only provisional stays against confusion. Um, you know, it's an answer of this moment that allows you to open your eyes the next morning and take the next breath and put the foot in front of the other and do what needs to be done. Um, but it's kind of important that we bring ourselves to uh, remember long division from elementary school when there was some remainder that you didn't know what to do with. Art is for the remainder. Oh, I, I love that. Thank you. Oh, uh, well, I tried to get a little bit of light in here. Um, just, you know, just because, but um, I so appreciate how you both were in Kurt's piece too. I think we're talking about the, um, that part of it is, is the listening that, Perhaps the most important part is the listening in the creative process, um, but also in, in the community process right now. One of the lessons that um, white Americans are learning, um, if they hadn't already known it, is, yeah, you need to listen right now. Um, and uh, so... I think that's a it's a great note to go out on and I hear my dog my hound dog is bawling outside I don't know if you can hear him. <laughs> that's uh, great oh uh, boy well um yeah thank you thank you all so much this has uh, just been a, a beautiful evening I feel so fortunate that uh, we were able to bring your voices together um and, um, and so thank you, Kurt and Jane and Bloss and Drew's recording, thank you. Um, and, um, and all of you who joined us as, uh, as listeners tonight, um, I wanna send out another reminder that we've got just a, another incredible lineup uh, coming up on July 22nd at the same time and the same place. Um, with, uh, with Simmons Bunton, that's Sandra Steingraber, Francisco Cantu, Diana Babineau, and Dean Rader. So uh, with that, we will, oh, hey, we're getting some love here on- uh, yes, we are. We're getting love, oh, I love that, thank you, <laughs> Eleanor, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Uh, yeah, so we'll say, say goodnight, um, dear America, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You, Hey, Bergen.